is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nest Tsunami podcast. This week, we were offering five conversations from Season 3, Episode 46, our review of the recent NFLD Summit, plus, from the vault, a section from December 2021 looking at the relationship between weight loss related to bariatric surgery and liver fibrosis and how that might compare to the results we will get from drugs and development. In this conversation, each panel, Mazen Nuruddin, Sven Frank, Hannes Hochstrom and I discussed one paper, presentation, or theme from the FLD Summit we found particularly compelling. Hannes leads off by talking about the way that alcohol consumption can confound trial results. His presentation at the conference stated that at least 10% of patients in NAFLD trials consume alcohol at levels far higher than indicated in the trial protocol, and goes on to share points from his paper about how to identify these patients and manage them best both for their own health and a successful non-confounded trial result. Next, Sven focuses on a Friday afternoon session looking at the impact that treatment of metabolic comorbidities could have on natural clinical trials. He points out the benefit of having representatives of many medical specialties in this conversation, and after the group commends him on his fine cardiovascular vascular talk. He notes that since NASH is a metabolic multisystemic disease, the researcher must keep the entire scope in focus when designing and executing NASH trials. We continue this conversation about initial thoughts in our second conversation of the series. For the second straight week, it has been our pleasure and honor to cover a major medical meeting with significant science and policy issues attached. Also, this conversation brought some important voices in Nashville to the podcast for the first time, which is always a good thing. So sit back, Listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the dialogue on our LinkedIn discussion group. This conference was a two-day conference broken up over three days, Thursday afternoon, all day Friday, and Saturday morning to one o'clock with tremendous content. And what I would like each of us to do is pick one presentation or one session that we thought was particularly interesting or compelling, take a few minutes and talk about it, and we'll, each of us will do that, and then we'll see what we've got time left to do. So, brave one, go first. Who wants to start? Hannes Hockstrom. Okay, I can be a little on Swedish and jump right in. So, normally we Scandinavian people are a bit, you know, back. So, I'll contrast that and start. I think the session on overlooked topics in clinical trials was quite interesting. The discussion ended or centered mostly actually around the topic of underreported alcohol consumption. And that's a long-standing elephant in the room, if I can say so, which has been talked about back and forth. But I think we now in the past year or so have really started to acknowledge that this is a problem. Um, I guess that's the first step of also trying to handle the problem, acknowledging that it actually is a problem. So that was a a lively debate and I got some really interesting questions also afterwards. What did you present that you'd like to share with the people who listen? Just kind of a thumbnail level. Um, so I guess uh, the, the data I presented was a wrap up of that topic. So how common is this under reported alcohol consumption in patients with NAFLD and, and what is the potential uh, impact this might have on, on uh, things like clinical trials? While it's difficult to know exactly what the impact is on clinical trials, I would say at least that the potential impact is rather high. So the data supports something that something like 10% of patients with uh, NAFLD, if you take a specific biomarker concerning alcohol consumption, will actually have high levels of that biomarker, suggesting that they are underreporting alcohol consumption. And it, it's maybe not so surprising because fortunately we talk also a lot about stigma. The stigma of a high alcohol consumption is very high. So people did not feel so safe to talk about their true alcohol consumption. But if we can verify that with a biomarker, marker, we might be able to help the patient better if we have that information. So I guess that's the bottom line. I mean, 10% roughly, at least in observational cross-sectional studies, seem to have a higher than we think alcohol consumption. If that's a problem for clinical trials, I'm not so sure because at least my line of thinking would be that a person knows that they are maybe drinking a little bit too much, might be very reluctant to actually enter a clinical trial. But if we don't measure it in a clinical trial, we, we don't know. And now there are rather simple and, and affordable biomarkers for alcohol consumption that we in Sweden use extensively in, in our clinical practice. So very much advocate for us to, to start um, adding such uh, biomarkers at least once during the screening process in clinical trials to make sure we avoid that problem. You know, I went to a presentation on that subject in, in London at EASL, which will heretofore be known as the EASL Congress, which I think is a really smart piece of marketing on their part. Just use the name everybody is giving you anyway. But the person who did the presentation was academic, not necessarily a trials person any sense and was really uh, delighted at how effective the uh, method of testing hair was. 
without thinking about how long it took to get results back or the fact that that would render participation in trials virtually undoable. So watching you talk about the same subject and not get to hair until like the third to the last slide and have a whole bunch of simpler, faster biomarkers uh, made me feel a lot better about the subject. I don't know if it had any effect on anybody else. Other thoughts? Mazen Nuruddin. I think he did an outstanding presentation. I I just want to comment on this session. It was a beautiful session. Both of you gave talks in that session. And I just want to praise the high scientific level in that session session. I'm honored to be here with these two guys. It's my first time on the podcast with them. And for those that they are jumping the first time on Nash, let's say, I mean, our colleagues are very well known. Sven just had the New England Journal paper and many other papers. And Dr. Huckstrom, it's like we, we learned a lot from his publication that informed the field. So it was a fascinating session. I think the topics were smartly picked up. I think Sven, you talked about the cardiovascular comorbidities. We talked about alcohol. I think in the future, there are others, but those were the most important. I think Ezel picked them very nicely, but there are others, for instance, the kidney and how we don't enroll people with renal failure in clinical trials. People eventually with cardiovascular disease, we know in diabetes, they move to that. Now we're excluding all those, as you said, rightfully so at this time, but eventually we have to deal with NASH and heart failure, for instance. It's just to give people an idea about the future where we're going to go eventually beyond the conventional method, hopefully beyond the biopsy, so we can enroll a large number of patient NITs look at cardiovascular outcomes, and then we're going to explore the populations that now we exclude them, such as the cardiovascular disease, the renal failure, and all that. Saying that, I think it was put earlier in a nice well, the alcohol is a very complicated topic, uh, needs to be continued to be studied and nailed down. There were discussions from that meeting about NAFLD and NAFLD, although it was brief and a moderate alcohol consumption, so that will come into solution hopefully soon. But the point that was brought up about terminology when talking about alcohol, for instance, when you throw alcohol in the mix, especially more than the amounts that we're, we're enrolling clinical trials, you're, not, you're changing the natural history, and that requires a whole new considerations. So I think that your talk covered uh, a lot of important things in clinical trials, and I'm glad that was one of the assigned topics. I agree with that. I'll come back to this later when I talk about what I found most interesting. But alcohol is a Hawthorne effect, because if somebody goes into the trial and actually drinks less while they're in the trial, one would suspect that after the trial ends, their alcohol consumption will go back to previous level. And as you'll hear when you get to my take on this meeting, Hawthorne effect, something I know a little bit about, was thrown around this morning and not necessarily uh, used in the way it should be. But alcohol would be absolutely Hawthorne effect. Sven, what would you like to talk about? Sven Frank. There were, of course, many interesting sessions. So making a choice is a difficult task that you ask. But one of the things that I was most interested in was a session on Friday afternoon about how treating comorbidities also can have an impact on the treatment of NASH and we were fortunate to have some non-hepatology colleagues in the meeting, endocrinologists, obesity physicians uh, giving their point of view and, and some of them have also long-standing expertise in NAFLD so they are really not new to the field and then it's, it's interesting to see how their approach is a little bit different sometimes from our poor liver-centered view and they have newer guidelines and NAFLD is coming into it and also the concept that with some of the drugs they use they are also doing something beneficial for NAFLD, like bioglitazone has been mentioned many times throughout this conference. Semaglutide, obviously, also bariatric surgery. So all treatments that have tremendous impact on comorbidities that are linked to NAFLD. But for some of these, we also have data, phase two data, that it's beneficial for NAFLD too. And they start really to incorporate that in their therapeutic management of patients. And we discussed also a little bit, and one of the colleagues has put forward a question, you're doing that, but you do not have phase three data. Then you get the again, to the multidisciplinary approach where they say, okay, but we are not using them off-label. We are using them for our patients with obesity or diabetes that have NAFLD. So it's within the registered indications, but it's tailored and it takes into account that there is also a liver problem. And I found that multidisciplinary approach and that take on the disease by non-hepatologists, a very interesting evolution. So, you know, one of the things that we're doing right now is we're doing a special series on patients with type 2 diabetes and obesity and how should you think about treating them. Them. So a lot of those topics have actually been coming up in that podcast as well. Here, though, I think just a lot more of it. And I agree with you that getting people in from other specialties has helped tremendously. I also would like to comment on the talk. You gave the cardiovascular talk that Mazda mentioned, which I found eye-opening. I learned a bunch because we all know that that's an issue, but getting it into context and getting beneath the first two sentences of the story, I think are really important. So it was helpful to be able to watch you lead us 
through that. I thought that worked out really well. Thanks for your positive comments. But indeed, I think this is not an isolated liver problem. It's part of a, a multisystemic disease. It's more a syndrome, if you want. And the relationship between the different organs is, is, is very complicated. So, of course, we are focusing on the liver and we want to improve liver health. But we have to take into account that there are also other comorbidities that are quite intimately linked to an FOD. And we should incorporate that in our clinical trials and also in our routine clinical practice, not just from a safety perspective, because that's mostly the point uh, where we are looking at now, but, but also from an efficacy standpoint, because many of the things that we are doing can be beneficial for the liver and for the cardiovascular system. And of course, we do not have trials with thousands and thousands of patients, although in the phase three trials, we are approaching those those figures. And we still do not have trials with, with five, six, seven years follow-up. That's, that's probably what we need for cardiovascular events. But there are ways to already now incorporate some aspects in our clinical trials and at least get some preliminary data and a first idea how we can better integrate that aspect of the disease into our clinical trials to increase our knowledge and to have a more tailored approach in the end for our patients. And now, back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next week to discuss some highlights from the EASD and British Liver Association meetings with folks who attended those events. In the meantime, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now.